This is John Jackson Miller, writer of Star Wars comics and novels, and you're listening to Star Wars with Stevie B. May the Force be with you. Hey there, everyone. Welcome. I'm very excited for my guest today. He's a New York Times bestselling author. He's made so many, many amazing contributions from Star Wars and the galaxy far, far away, and also Star Trek, which he's been out and about lately promoting his new and upcoming novel titled The High Country. My pleasure to introduce Mr. John Jackson Miller. Hey, Stevie. How are you doing today? Good. How are you doing, sir? I'm all right. Uh, we, we're both from the from the same state, different oh. areas. And uh, I was curious, what's the weather like by you today? Okay, well, where, where are you at? In Wisconsin. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I have to ask because from the same state, I'm from Tennessee, but I moved here 30 years ago. Uh, and uh, and uh, actually, it's 30 years this year, which is hard to believe. So I guess... I, I'm now more of a Wisconsinite than I am a Tennessean, I suppose. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm looking out the window, and it's uh, you know ice uh, on the lake everywhere, and I've got turkeys walking around outside, and <laughs> it's I'm in the middle of the rural area here. So yeah, yeah, it was uh, negative twenty in the twenties the last few days, and oh, dear. the That's wife so... and I uh, bundled up today. It's it's nice out, sunshine, and we took the dog for a walk, so yeah, it was good gotta, to get outside. I got to order a new tank of propane tomorrow, so. <laughs> oh, I feel for you. I feel for you. So I met you a few times. You came to my local library for an event. It was it was amazing. And when I met you, I just I was nervous because here's the author of Kenobi and all these amazing Star Wars books, you know. But then I started talking to you and it just it felt like I was talking to one of the guys. <laughs> and, and that means I appreciate oh, that. Well, you know, I am. <laughs> yeah, you, you get excited just as much as we do talking about it. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and that's great. Uh, it is a weird way to make a living. Uh, I'm fortunate that uh, you know, this stage of my career uh, has mostly been about writing stuff I was interested in. I mean, um, you know, when I began, um, and well, I'd been a journalist in college, but uh, you know, my first actual uh, day job uh, was down in Tennessee again, and it was uh, editing a line of magazines for the lumber industry. And I don't know uh, how much you uh, know about the lumber industry, but it's not really as glamorous as whatever you're imagining. <laughs> so I've heard, so I've heard. Yeah, it was, uh, it involved me on the phone with a lot of people in Wisconsin frequently uh, doing the reporting, but it just was not my thing. Um, but it was good practice you know, to be able to write about uh, things that uh, that I uh, didn't necessarily care about. Um, and uh, you know, then I, I got the opportunity to come up and work uh, with Don and Maggie Thompson uh, up in uh, Wisconsin, uh, where Krause Publications was. Uh, and that uh, was at the time, it was the world's largest publisher of hobby magazines. So uh, I ended up uh, as the editor of Comics Retailer, which is a trade magazine for uh, comic shops, okay. um, and was also working on Comics Buyer's Guide uh, with the two of them. And then for many, many years uh, with Maggie after after Don passed, I learned an incredible amount from the two of them, uh, just more than I can I can say. Uh, and, um, you know, I, over the years, uh, you know, interacted with comics publishers and, uh, and uh, publishers of role-playing games and card games. Yep. Uh, the late 1990s, um, Actually, it's really at the end of the century there, uh, the company bought a magazine called Scry, uh, which was the card game magazine, so yep. not, you know, collectible card games. Uh, and I became our editor of that, uh, and uh, I wrote uh, or co-wrote uh, with Joyce Greenholt a big encyclopedia of all of the card games that had come out in the previous 10 years. And so there was huge sections of Star Wars in there. Uh, and also, at the time, I, I did for the company a an unlicensed uh, Star Wars collectibles magazine that came out for uh, uh, Phantom Menace, so it would have been uh, it would have been April of 2099, probably that the magazine came out. Uh, so you know, I I was interacting with Star Wars uh, as a professional before I was actually writing for it, and of course, you know, before all of that, I had certainly been a fan, and that's a that's a you know that's a that's a whole another conversation or part of the conversation. Uh, but uh, you know, the the fact is that uh, you know once. I, uh, you know, started writing comics uh, professionally. Uh, you know, I, I was moonlighting writing for Marvel. Uh, and then that led to me getting to uh, a chance to pitch for Star Wars comics at Dark Horse. Um, you know, I was able to say that, 
yeah, I, uh, I had had the training to write, but also I had all these years of background, um, you know, both as a Star Wars fan and then also, you know, working uh, on the periphery covering Lucasfilm's licensees. So, you know, the whole time that, um, you know, the, uh, the uh, you know, see now I'm blanking on it. Uh, the 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 the, uh, the storyline that happened in between Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi, uh, yeah. the uh, Shadows of the Empire, Shadows of the Empire. I knew it was Shadows yes, of something. Yep. One of the things is they use the same uh, formulations of names all over and over and over again. Right. So you might have a book called Shadow of the Sith and Shadows of the Empire and Rise of the Empire is one of mine, and yep. uh, and it just uh, you know, they they all sort of run together after a while. But yeah, I mean, I was covering that uh, when it came out, which I guess was like 96, 97. Yeah. Uh, you know, on the outside is somebody reporting on the companies that were involved. Uh, so, so yeah, I was, I was certainly aware of what was going on in Star Wars before I began writing for it. Yeah, that's impressive. I didn't really realize until probably about a year and a half ago, like how much lore and history there is besides just the movies. Oh yeah. Right. I mean, so the comic book side of things, I never, I'm just recently getting into, I just uh, actually read the Epic volume four of the old Republic. Oh yeah. So very good. And uh, volume five comes out, uh, I believe March 7th. Uh, yes. I was just going to hit that for you too. I got it pre-ordered <laughs> cool. and uh, you can, cool. pre yeah, you can pre-order it off of your site and uh, I'll link that in the description. So oh, I'm excited. Good. I'm excited for that. So you started, started right back in college. You did the lumber mill thing and it, in high school, like when did your actual that spark hit you that you wanted to be a writer? Uh, well, that actually predates Star Wars even because I I was uh, I started collecting comics when I was six. Uh, my mother was a grade school librarian, so she never threw my comics out. She encouraged me to keep them in order, uh, and uh, so I pretty much have everything I ever you know bought as a kid. Uh, <laughs> and then Star Wars, I got introduced to uh, when it came out. I would have been nine years old, and uh, nobody could get into the movie for the longest time because it was before the days of uh, multiplexes. Okay. Uh, and so um, I actually read the comic book adaptation of the movie before I saw it. Uh, and that was possible because um, Lucasfilm had made a deal with Marvel to begin releasing, well, first of all, the, the, the novel version of Star Wars, the novelization, that Alan Dean Foster wrote that came out at the end of 1976. So we're, we're talking about, you know, five months before the movie. And then the comics, I think at least three issues were out by the time the, the movie came out. And by the time I got in, you know, I was able to, I was able to read the whole thing. Uh, and, uh, but even having spoiled it for myself a little, it didn't, you know, compare to what I saw on the screen. Um, you know, my sister uh, made sure that I got in to see the movie and uh, that's, one of the reasons that I, I dedicated the Kenobi novel to her uh, mm -hmm. and uh, to to Kathy for making sure her kid brother got in to see the movie. Uh, and uh, and then, of course, she she also bought the soundtrack and she made sure that I was stocked with, uh, you know, the action figures as they came out. And and, you know, it was uh, it was a long time before, um, you know, you could actually see the movie on home video. Uh, it was certainly, you know, nobody had a VCR that I knew back then and it wasn't available. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think February 1st, uh, 1983 was when the movie first appeared on television, uh, which was uh, wow. HBO. And mm -hmm. uh, I prided myself on watching the movie 25 times that month. <laughs> so <laughs> got your money's worth there. Well, yeah. Or the, you know, the rental or whatever, the, whatever the cable the fee. fee was at the time. Yeah. Uh, but again, that was before we had a, a VCR in our house um, and uh, a recorder. And so, you know, that was, that was kind of the way that you saw things is as they were streaming at you, except you didn't have a choice when it was streaming. Right. Yeah. I remember having a, I finally got a VHS player. You know, I was yeah. uh, the nineties and I would watch the, the movies on repeat. I would fall asleep to them, you know? Oh, yeah. It was, yeah. It was, it was beautiful, but yeah, you were lucky enough to have a VCR. I would imagine. And kids don't really realize today what it was like back then without all this social media and streaming and everything oh, yeah. in your face. You know, I have two, my boys are 12 and 14. Mm -hmm. So, you know, social media and their friends is like the world to them. So oh yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to get them, get them reading and more involved. 
Well, you know, what, what served that role for us in fandom at the time were conventions, uh, which I started going to in high school and, you know, going to the comic shop, which again, yep. I started doing in high school. And, uh, and then also magazines, uh, you know, fanzines or more professional magazines like Comics Buyer's Guide, which was this weekly newspaper. And, um, you know, so I, you know, can say that I learned a lot about uh, not just Star Wars, but Star Trek and Doctor Who and all sorts of other things from yeah, yeah. fans talking to fans about things. Uh, and uh, and so, you know, it, it, it's it's one of those things where, um, yeah, people say, well, it must have been a much uh, calmer world back then. No, there were still arguments in the letters pages. They were still you know, incendiary uh, you know, things going on, but you know, back and forth in, uh, in in the letters column. It was just a week at a time. You know, there was a break, there was yeah. a, and there was a there was a, a person in between mediating in terms of yeah, you know, do we really publish this response or not publish this response? Yeah. Um, and so yeah, I mean, it was it was sort of a different thing. Uh, you know, uh, people. Um, People care about it, uh, and and they're willing to fight over it uh, because of that. But in the right. end, you know, it is uh, you know a movie. It's a it's 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 imaginary. It's entertainment. Uh, it calls to mind, you know, a a joke that uh, the professors in my grad school uh, used to tell. Uh, why are all the arguments that the uh, the the professors have? Uh, about their field, why are they all so vitriolic? And the response was because the stakes are so low. It just doesn't mean anything, <laughs> whether you're right or wrong. And and again, you know, um, you know, whether we're talking about uh, 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 you know how whether whether you know, Han shot first or not. Well, Han right. Solo doesn't care whether you thought he shot first. Uh, he's a, he's a, he got a, the job done. Yeah. And yeah. And, and again, you know, he's a, he's a character on celluloid. I mean, he's a, he's a fictional character. So it's, right. uh, it's, and, and, you know, just all sorts of every other debate that you see online, it, it tends, tends to, you know, wind down to, you know, really. <laughs> yeah. It's supposed to be something there that's supposed to take us out of, you know, all the, the things that are going on in our lives and give us happiness and joy. That's the way I look at it. Well, there's the line from, uh, you know, and, and, and uh, there's a Saturday Night Live episode. I don't know if you remember when William Shatner was on in the 90s, where he's, yeah. he, he's at a, he's at a, he's at a Star Trek convention and people are, are pounding him with, with crazy little questions. And at, at one point he, he, he screams, yeah, this this made everybody mad, but he screamed, "Get a life!" Uh, but what he what he what he says after that though is what I I think is the more important thing is you you, you took a job that I did for a lark thirty years ago and you turned it into a colossal waste of time. Uh, it's and it's what it is. Not, not not that it's a waste of time, but it is a it's a pastime. It's a thing where people are actually you know soaking up their time and their hours, uh, you know, arguing about things that they care about. And again. Uh, you know, this is not to say that that uh, that you know, not, none of it matters. Um, you know, all the stories that we, uh, that, you know, that that mean something to us matter. Um, you know, I, I said that in the uh, in the uh, introduction to the New Dawn book that I did, uh, which was the first book after Legends, uh, yep. you know, happens. Um, but it's just at the same time I say, you know, I'm glad that you care about the books. The books are still on the shelf. The books are still for sale. Yep. The the uh, you know we still make money when you buy them, uh, and uh, if you still enjoy them and they still speak to you, uh, you know please, you know that's that's uh, nobody's going to take anything away from that. Absolutely, yeah. So all, all everybody's got their own aspect, their own outlook, but whatever, however it touches and you know makes them feel mm -hmm. good for them, right? And I love the Scry magazine, by the way. I used to be a big Magic the Gathering fan, so I would get them constantly. Uh, yeah, that was uh, that was one of the hardest jobs I ever had because um, I had played Magic, and you know, I think I had the very first Star Wars CCG release and realized, yeah, I, I'm not, never going to find anybody to play against with this. And uh, but then after that, I didn't learn anything else. And so when the magazine was dumped on us, it was sort of like. Okay, Pokemon. How does yeah. this game work? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, I can imagine what you had to go through with that magazine, but I loved it. I just wanted to tell yeah, you that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. So your sister Kathy brought you to the to see Star Wars, got you all into it. Was there was that like your first introduction into like the sci-fi fantasy realm? 
Um, you know, I, I, there was a couple of things. Uh, you know, Star Trek had obviously been on TV in reruns. Uh, yeah. I was too yeah. young to see it in in first run, but I, I certainly had, had seen uh, Star Trek. Um, you know, Planet of the Apes. They had put that on TV uh, in uh, in the early seventies. They put all the first three movies on in consecutive Fridays, and that really uh, you know became a big deal. Um, you know, other science fiction like shows at that time that were a big deal before Star Wars. Uh, you know, a six million dollar man was on TV, the Bionic Man, uh, yeah, and uh, of course he was an astronaut, and so there was a space element there. And even though I didn't see the movie until probably after I saw Star Wars, uh, you know, the last real big feature film, uh, uh, you know, science fiction thing before Star Wars would have been Logan's Run, and uh, you know, I, I love that film too. And so, uh, you know, I was into this sort of thing. I started drawing my own comics. Uh, as I said, uh, just about the same time I started reading them. So I had a I had a character called Space Tracer who was uh, a kid in a spaceship, and he had no other he had no motive, he had no character, he had no anything other than he had the spaceship, and he went flying around. So <laughs> that's cool. That's cool. Did you publish it? I, well, I I, uh, I didn't uh, I didn't photocopy it. I just I you know, I, I had Miller Comics was my brand, and I would have it's issue numbers on them and everything. Now later on, uh, I did start um, you know, publishing uh, when I not not that character, but uh, but one of the things that was around um, and is still around. It's just not that big, but uh, anymore. But in the eighties, um, you know, there was a movement called small the small press comics movement uh where it's mini comics it was uh you know eight and a half by 11 you know pages folded over where we would photocopy them down to the copy uh copy machine store or whatever and uh and then we would just mail them back and forth and uh a number of people who would go on to be uh you know active in in you know, professional comics later on we're doing this. And, uh, you know, there were, there were other formats of that before that. Uh, but, uh, yeah, as soon as my, uh, my dad got a copy machine for the house, uh, it was off to the races for me. Perfect. No better way than that. I, uh, I was talking to my mom the other day, we were talking about shows actually that you bring that up and see, I didn't grow up with any science fiction. My family really wasn't into that, Yeah. but like, so it was like happy days. Oh, yeah. And it made me laugh because we were talking about it. And then I heard on Word Balloon earlier in the week you were on there and you were talking about old TV series and yeah. you, you mentioned Happy Days. Yeah. And my mom's got a leather jacket of the fawn still <laughs> signed. Well, and, and even even Happy Days catches the Star Wars bug because of uh, Mork and Mindy, because... Uh, you know, Gary Marshall saw the, uh, actually his, his kids, uh, were, were either his kids or his grandkids, one or the other were, were fascinated with star Wars. And so he wanted to put a Martian in the TV show. And then they just happened to find a Martian, uh, street performer in, in Robin Williams. Uh, yeah. so uh -huh. you know, it, it's kind of interesting how all of these threads sort of interrelate, um, things that were big in pop culture at the same time or, or that fed off of one another. Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, you have a lot of things that came out of that period, like, uh, like Battlestar Galactica that took on a completely different unrelated life later on, um, and is a long way from where it started. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I think these, you know, things about the roots of things, I, I find them fascinating. Yeah. It's funny how things kind of intertwine themselves. It, it's cool. It's just magic how that stuff happens. Mm-hmm. So is there, so you started off kind of writing mini comics that was, yeah. and then you later on you went to college and got into it. Is there either one different, harder than the other to write like the script for a comic? Yeah. Um, you know, the, uh, I, most of the first part, professional part of my career was doing uh, scripting for comics. And then I, um, you know, I, I got some short story work uh, first for the star Wars website. Uh, then for, um, Del Rey, I did the uh, the Lost Tribe of the Sith series uh, and uh, various other short stories over the years. And then that led to uh, me getting um, you know, the first novel that I did, did which was Night Errant. Uh, and I was doing both the novel and the, the comic simultaneously. Um, and uh, you know, the thing is, uh, yeah, it's, it's just different. I mean, the tempo is different. Uh, you know, the deadlines, you're breaking the comic book series up into multiple different installments. Uh, you know, the big, uh, the big uh, 
you know, Knights of the Old Republic collection that's behind me. Huh. Yeah, that's 57 issues that came out over the course of five years. Uh, no way could I have gone away and written that all at once. Uh, it was it was something where it was Infection. you know coming out a month at a time, and so it was being written a month at a time, and you know it it you know taxed this way and that depending on what the publisher needs. So you know I can definitely tell you that where we wound up in issue you know, a, a, after fifty or so issues is not where I had initially imagined because it was changing as we went, uh, as we reacted to various things in the market and and you know what the editors were looking for. Um, so it's just a, it's just a, a different animal. Whereas, you know, a novel, um, uh, this is the, you know, the, my strange yeah. new worlds novel we're talking, uh, we're talking about earlier. That's, uh, the, the high country, which comes out uh, February 21st. Um, it's also a big sprawling yeah, epic. It's the longest book I've written yet, uh, in terms of a, a single novel. Um, I've done a trilogy before, but it's not quite the same, uh, but, but you know, in, in, in these cases, I have to know kind of where I'm going right from the beginning. And okay. I have to, uh, you know, even though I can deviate from the outline some, and I usually do, uh, I, I need to be able to tell the, uh, the licensors uh, who own Star Trek or Star Wars or whatever it is, I need to be able to tell them what's going to happen in the book. Okay. And um, so, you know, it's, it, it is different in that sense. Uh, and, uh, you know, of course, also I'm, doing all the description of characters um, and settings and things. I'm doing that on my own. And uh, that is one of the fun things about, again, this book coming up is uh, because I needed to know it, I scribbled out maps for myself. And when the book got delayed because of the uh, paper shortage, we decided to put maps in the book. So there are, this is the first Star Trek novel since 2000 with maps in it. So wow. I, yeah, it's like, why not? I did that with Lost Tribe of the Sith. We put our maps in there. Yeah, so, um, that was cool, too. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, okay. This so, one has more. <laughs> perfect. Everybody <laughs> likes a little bonus material with their book, right? Some more things to get them all flustered. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so do you collaborate with, like, the, the artists? Like, you say you create all your own characters and designs and such. Do you do the, do the artists send you what you oh, want to see? Oh, if we're talking... If we're talking about comics, um, you know, it is a case where it starts with me listing who the characters are and sometimes giving some specifics. Uh, but then, you know, for a series like Knights of the Old Republic um, or Knight Errant, when those were being created, uh, the looks of the characters, uh, those were generated by the artists. Uh, and sometimes we make tweaks to them and, and okay. say, yeah, let's go with you know, option B instead of option A. Uh, but uh, in general, um, you know, I uh, I kind of go with whatever they want to do because they're going to be the ones that are going to have to draw this thing for days and days on end, uh, and uh, they almost certainly are, are better at it than I am. So, uh, yeah. uh, well, not almost certainly certainly are better at drawing it than I am. Uh, so, so yeah, and uh, you know, this even extends to um, you know, Michael Atia is the uh, colorist who colored almost every single thing I did at Dark Horse, uh, whether it was. Star Wars or, or Mass Effect or something else, uh, and in and and in and and, uh, and so one of the stages that's uh, in the process is figuring out what the colors the costumes are going to be, uh, the outfits, um, characters' eyes, that sort of thing, uh, and uh, so he's always involved in that too. Uh, so uh, so yeah, it's a it's a different kind of a thing. You know, often they will come up with ideas that I didn't have and. Uh, so, for example, the weapon that Jarrell has that's in the uh, in the Knights of the Old Republic series, yeah, I don't know that I actually specifically described that. Um, but but then there are other times where you know I did. I mean, I when uh, I created the the uh, the, uh, the, you know, the very first thing I did with Marvel um, was Crimson Dynamo, which was a, a new version of the Crimson Dynamo armor, uh, and Steve Ellis was the artist, and in creating that. I gave him a list of here's the stuff I need to see on this armor. I mean, this we need to have this kind of a microwave device, and we need this kind of a weapon, and we need this kind of a thing. So, um, and then he and then he made it to spec. Uh, but uh, that was a case where I was I was uh, you know more involved with it. That's cool. Yeah, that's good. I've always wondered that because I wasn't sure how yeah. how that all operated. Or it, how, it varies uh, from book to book. To to be real, I mean, to be real honest, I mean, it's and from from uh, partnership to partnership. 
Okay. And also, I was going to ask, how do you come up with some of these names? You know, like Zane Carrick and, and yeah. Kara Holt, you know, like, it's just, I've always wondered that as well. Okay. Uh, well, uh, Zane Carrick. Uh, Zane, I was looking for sort of a, I guess, a Western sounding name. And then I put a Y in it so that it wouldn't uh, sound too Earth-like. And of course, naturally, somebody then named their child Zane with the, the, the <laughs> with the new spelling. Uh, Carrick. Uh, that is the name of the dormitory uh, that I lived in for uh, almost all of my time uh, at the University of Tennessee. Uh, and uh, Holt, uh, Kara Holt uh, in Night Errant, uh, Holt was the name of the apartment complex that I lived in when I was not in the, uh, uh, the dorm was there. Uh, and, and Kara, that's really sort of funny because uh, the, the name of the book was Night Errant. And I hadn't figured out what to call her yet. So Knight Errant is the first, or rather Kara is the first letter of Knight and the first four letters of Errant. So that it's K. Cool. So her name is on the every the cover of every book if you, if you hide the other letters. That's uh, awesome. Um, and, you know, often I'm more, you know, careful than that or not careful, but I'm, I'm more deliberate than that. And I, I put more thought into it than that. Uh, wow. but, uh, but no, I mean, one of the things that you find yourself doing is um, you'll take the list of characters you've created and you'll try to, you know, alphabetize them and make sure that you're not uh, using the same first letter a bunch of times. Cause that's going to confuse people. Yeah. Um, and uh, the other thing that I do, and I've done it a lot more now that I've been writing novels where there's audiobooks, uh, is I am absolutely staying away from uh, exotic spellings uh, of, you know, uh, outer space names uh, where, yeah. you know, there's absolutely no way for the reader to pronounce them. Uh, so, uh, or, or where, where there's some guesswork involved. Uh, I try to spell everything the way that it sounds. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's cool. Yeah. I'm wondering that because sometimes, like you said, it's hard. Some, they come up with crazy names and it's hard to pronounce and you're trying to Wikipedia and see the yeah. breakdown and clapping and, the syllables on your hand. And I've had many cases where, you know, I, I haven't, remembered how to spell a name that I've, I've created. That's got a crazy spelling. So, um, you know, putting in, uh, our, our big trick is putting in, you know, double letters all over the place, double yeah. a double V double. Yeah. So I, I had a character who's last, who, who's a Garabas who had a double V in his name. And somebody asked, well, how would you pronounce that? And it's like, well, there really is no double V pronunciation. It's not even anything. It's a, uh, it was an affectation and I would not do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So jumping back to working with the comic book guys and, and the novel now, does like the story group reach out and pitch you an idea or do you have ideas that you've already got kind of in it, motion? It depends on the project. Um, the story group, you know, everything after 2014 involves the, the story group. Um, in the case of, for example, um, uh, Canto Bite, which is the book that I did, which was about the casino world from episode eight. Um that was a case where, uh, you know, Lucasfilm uh, and uh, the editors of Del Rey uh, contacted us because it was four writers uh, that did that book and said, hell, okay, look, here's the, uh, here is this casino world. Here are some characters that we know will be populating the background of this, uh, of this uh, part of the movie. And, uh, and, you know, here's sort of a nudge with each character of what their, you know, what their, special ability is or whatever, uh, or who they might be. And, um, so, uh, you know, in the case of that book, I looked at that sort of catalog of characters and it had, uh, the three little green guys that, uh, appear in the background, uh, of the casino. Um, you know, they had said, well, these, these guys are the lucky three. They're, uh, uh, Wody, Thody, and, uh, I, I, I think Dodie. Uh, and they and and all we know about them is that their earth uh, their their luck is unearthly, and so I said, okay, well here's what I want to do. I've got the, I, I I pointed out an image in the catalog that they gave us. I said this guy looks like a well dressed, well groomed card player. Uh, I want to do a story about a, uh, a you know a, a a a professional card player who has a system who is working his way toward getting this one progressive jackpot. Uh, that has been out there. He's been working for years and years, and uh, and he's out of time because the the mobsters on the planet are after him. 
He's got to make it in, 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 he's got to make his million that night. And then the lucky three come up and they win the pot without even trying. And then they blow it like five minutes later, someplace else doing something stupid. And, and, uh, and so I said, and the story will be that he realizes that the only way that he can actually uh, you know, survive uh, the night is to make his million back. And the only way to do that is to follow these three guys around yeah. and bet on what they bet on and hope that he will get a jackpot and hope that he will be able to walk out of there. And that story was, you know, one of the more fun things I've ever done. I mean, it, it's just yeah. a delight. Uh, it's called The Ride, and it is a novella, which is in, in the uh, you know, Cano Bite collection. Yeah, four but, authors. Yeah. But, the, but the thing is, um, you know, I would say that the, you know, the, the you know, Lucasfilm had input in it. Uh, right. And, you know, when I wanted to bring in a character from Kenobi to have, a, have that character appear in the book, uh, you know, they, they said that was cool. Uh, but, you know, otherwise, um, other than, you know, you know, me needing at, at times to know, uh, you know, what, how, how certain games of chance were, you know, uh, played yeah, uh, right. and, and other things. Uh, you know, that was, you know, I would say, you know, for the vast majority of that story came from me and from the other authors. Awesome. Yeah, because you did some uh, more short stories from a certain point of view and yeah. you did some in the Star Wars Insider magazines. That's right. And and I was going to ask, are, is that some of the more fun side of things for you where you get a little creative freedom and you get to let loose? Well, I mean, it's it's much different, you know, doing a 3,000 word story than it is uh, you're right. doing a 100,000 word novel. I, I mean, you're only going to get to do a couple of scenes. Uh, but you could, you know, do a, you could tell a kind of story that you would probably not be, uh, you know, hired to do if, if it was what the entire novel was about. And so, you know, one of the earliest, uh, the earliest short story that I did for the Star Wars website was, uh, was a Knights of the Old Republic story with Zane and Griff. And it was just, the whole story was just a, a generic swindle that, Griff tried to do with art collectors and where Zane is in the middle of it and everything goes haywire. And, um, you know, that is, that is, uh, that is the story. And it's, uh, and, uh, again, I, I, because I wrote it from Griff's point of view, uh, it was more fun than it would have been, uh, because you got to hear it in his voice. Yeah. That's one. See, I'm not familiar as much yet as the Knights of the Old Republic. I'm still working on the comic book side of things. And I yeah. know you were carrying around them omnibuses that are, <laughs> that are very hard to get. They look yeah, heavy. they are. So they're, I'll take they them are, off your they, hand. They're, they're, much, they're, much, they're much cheaper digitally So, uh, right. so for people who like those. So you mentioned before the, the story group, we kind of will hit on it here. In 2014, things kind of changed. There was <laughs> Legends, now the new canon. And you've got to write through all the timelines and the continuities now. Yeah. Is there a favorite time era that you like to write in? Um, you know, I, I, I've enjoyed it all. I mean, the, uh, you know, you know, the Kenobi book obviously is the first book I did. That's sort of in that, um, in that movie era, uh, or in between movie era. Um, but, uh, but you know, the, the, the thing is being able to sort of spread out, uh, and, and, you know, create things, without colliding into anything. Uh, one of the benefits of Knight Errant, which again is being reprinted in that, that volume five that's coming up, uh, is that um, there was nothing anywhere near me. I mean, there was the, I was a generation before the Jedi versus Sith book and Darth Bane. Uh, and, you know, nobody knew what the galaxy was really like at that moment. And what I chose to do was to sort of limit my footprint to one sector and I, yeah, this, yeah. this this will be the sector. But I I came up with a map for it, and I came up with um, which we 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 did that map on StarWars.com, and I think it's still up there as a uh, uh, you know essential essential uh, atlas uh, supplement to it. Uh, if it's not still up there, I think I have the archive link on my site. Uh, but again, uh, you know, it was it was it gave me the chance to really just sort of you know spread out do whatever I wanted to do again, likewise with lost tribe of the Sith. Uh, you know, I had this, I had this planet 5,000 years before the characters were going to be needed uh, <laughs> elsewhere. So I could 
take them on a winding path to get there. Yeah. Yeah. That was, I enjoyed that. It, it came out later as a whole book. At first it was yeah. just out at digitally, right? In, yeah. In it was pieces. out as eight individual digital short stories, which dropped in between the fate of the Jedi novels. Okay. Uh, and uh, we got about halfway through their, uh, you know, 5,000 year um, stay over the course of the books that I did uh, or the stories that I did. We put all eight of those stories plus the maps, plus a novella into the Lost Tribe of the Sith collect collected stories book. And then I did a graphic novel sequel. Yep. And, uh, you know, that which I think just takes place uh, very briefly after the, the book. Uh, and yeah, it is a case of, um, you know, because it was a small corner of the universe that was not going to collide with anything else anytime soon, uh, I was able to you know, kind of do what I wanted to. And that's that's fun. Yeah, I, I can imagine that's got to be a blast. Plus, maybe a little nerve wracking. Like you said, you limited yourself to, you know, I'm just going to stick around this area. Well, when I've done when I've done uh, tie in fiction uh, or comics. Uh, you know, when I did stuff for Halo, I said, please, um, I want to tell a story in a, in a corner where I'm not going to collide with anything because <laughs> I do not know the whole history uh, nearly as well as I would need to to be able to do that. Anything more sprawling. Has there any has there anything ar ar arise that where you had to contact another author or somebody oh, yeah. contacted you to say, hey, Mr. Miller, we want to write over here? Oh yeah, well, people are always um, usually through their editors are, are always communicating about what somebody's doing so that they don't collide with one another. Um, okay. And uh, you know, it was the case, for example, that when the Kenobi novel was initially uh, proposed, um, you know, we did not yet know that uh, in, over in Legacy uh, that uh, Ashar and Het uh, would be connected to that series. Uh, and uh, I won't give away how he is uh, connected to it, but they they let me know that, and that sort of told me, all right, well, I won't bring that character in. I wasn't planning on it anyway. Okay. Um, but uh, but uh, you know, uh, you know, they do air traffic control like that. Okay, all right, out there blowing the whistle and waving the sign, say yeah. <laughs> so you brought up Kenobi. Last year was a big year for you. We got the re-release of Kenobi in the mm -hmm. Essential Legends. We got the Barnes and Noble <laughs> leather beast. You yeah, know, which is the, it looks great. Uh, what was what's your thought? What were your thoughts on the Kenobi show? Well, I uh, I enjoyed seeing Obi Wan back. I mean, you know, and and Ellen McGregor back, and I I really was just delighted when uh, he uh, he talked about the novel and uh, in a video, and so did Deborah Chow. Um, you know, the story that uh, I told was obviously an arrival story that was in its DNA, you know, about his introduction to Tatooine. So it's it's a it's a it's a first day on the planet kind of a thing. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, obviously, you know, what they were doing was 10 years later. Uh, but even so, uh, you know, they wrote the uh, series so that it didn't conflict with uh, my book. Uh, and so that, uh, you know, it, it is open uh, to uh, ideas from the book, the the yeah you know, the uh, the whole thing about uh, Qui Gon uh, not uh, talking to Obi Wan, uh, you know that that's that obviously comes from the the novel first, right. yep. uh, and uh, and you know it's it's gratifying to see that uh, that is kept consistent through there. Yeah, that's a big big part of the book, touching really throughout, you yep. know, and I, I also really liked the relationship that you made around Annaline and Obi Wan. You know, because yeah. I've always felt Obi Wan, he's like the perfect, the light, right? Yeah. He's the, you know, he deserves to be happy. You know, yeah. so how was writing that part? I mean, um, you know, that was uh, that was very rewarding. I, I I have to say that um, you know, I uh, have heard from a lot of single moms who have uh, you know, read the book and then and then written or said, you know, um, you know what it's like uh, <laughs> dealing with. Uh, this day to day from watching Annaline uh, and and no, I, what 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 was really the case? It's it's you know my wife is raising the kids while I'm trying to write this novel and it's it's almost like she's trying to do it on her own uh, because uh, whether it's these this novel or these comic books or these other things, you know I I I know about these moments 
Uh, yeah, there's a moment where Annalene talks about in the novel where she talks about at the end of the day, she just sits at the table and, and stares uh, in, in the coffee. It's just because, because the day has been so taxing dealing with, you know, headstrong kids uh, in the book that uh, are, yeah. are constantly trying to kill themselves uh, by doing dangerous things. Uh, and so, you know, I guess that's just observation. And it may just not be uh, something that people have expected to see in a novel like this. Um, but, you know, I, I try to, I try to do that. I mean, you know, there are, um, there are other, you know, real life uh, you know, situations uh, uh, that people, uh, you know, encounter in uh, conversation or in their daily lives or whatever that pop up in a lot of the other books. Um, and, uh, and again, you know, all of the novels, uh, you usually have some sort of a psychological um, uh, you know, dilemma in them. And, and in the case of, of Kenobi and uh, New Dawn and uh, my uh, Star Trek novels, uh, Die Standing and Rogue Elements, those are all books where the main characters have been cut off from the lives that they once knew, cut off from the uh, uh the people that used to be surrounding them uh cut off from whatever roles they used to have and in every one of those books they have to sort of reinvent themselves start over come to peace come to terms with their new lives um and you know not let despair uh take over uh in the case of uh in the case of uh the rios character in rogue elements uh, or not let, um, you know, a, a, a self-destructive uh, response yeah. take over, as in the case of uh, Kanan in uh, New Dawn. Uh, and, uh, you know, or, uh, or anger take over, as in the case of the Emperor uh, in, um, uh, in Die Standing. Um, Die Standing, I was joking the other day, is really, basically, the Die Standing is in a sense like the Kenobi novel, except it imagines that the Emperor lost and he's the one that has to go into exile. Oh. Uh, so uh, it, it, it's uh, it, it, it sort of similar there. So, yeah, I mean, all of these uh, stories, you know, usually there's something that people are, are grappling with. Uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, it that makes it uh, more universal. Yeah. I was going to ask you where your where some of the inspiration comes from. You know, like you mentioned, you said yeah. you you watching your wife. You were doing the yeah. thing while you were working on Kenobi. So is I mean, real life situations that arise can end up in these novels, no problem. Sure thing. So Deborah Chow, Ewan McGregor, they read the book, they liked it. What would you? What did you think overall of the show? I mean, are you staying up to date with your Star Wars? Uh, I I am up to date on some things, not not others. I I did watch all of uh, Kenobi, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, I'm you know I I have not uh, been able to tear into a variety of other things. Yeah. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. Bad Batch is one that I just have not even uh, started on because I'm I'm just uh, I'm writing, <laughs> so and also I'm juggling multiple universes that have uh, lots of different. Uh, you know, streaming uh, uh, yeah. shows. And so there's a lot more content than there used to be. And uh, just trying to keep up uh, is a, a bit of a challenge. Doesn't mean that I won't get to it, uh, but it, it it is the case where I will give priority to the thing that I'm working on. Yeah. I can imagine behind you, you got two big billboards with maps and little <laughs> going all over to try to well, keep the... Actually, they're over there. Oh, I've got, yeah, I was right. I've got, I've got if, I, if I turn the camera around, you'd see a... You'd see I have Star Wars the Galaxy uh, map uh, on on the uh, on the back of the door, and then I have my alcove where I have the Beta Quadrant on one wall and the Alpha Quadrant Man. on the other wall, uh, because I kind of need to know where stuff is. Yeah, yeah, I called that one, and no, I'm not a creeper. <laughs> That's <everyone>. all good. <laughs> so, do you have any pre-writing rituals, like you know, a cup of coffee, listen to some music beforehand? Uh, you know, with the novels, well, I don't do music. Uh, I, I, I try to you know, turn off um, increasingly for, for actually writing the novel. I go to another room besides my office where, um, you know, I've got the internet in case I need it, but I have never installed, uh, you know, my, my email browser. 
uh, for that. I've never installed or my, my email program. I I try to absolutely, you know, you know focus on what it is and um, you know the uh, and not do anything where you know I've got notifications coming in constantly. Um, now I keep the cell phone in another room. Uh, and uh, you, you, one thing I will do, which is kind of fun, is uh, I will uh, put on uh, the the because uh, I'll, I'll I, I I sit in front of the window, so I've got you know, the winter outside. Oh, you yeah. can see. But uh, uh, the TV, what I'll do is I'll put on um, uh, a streaming uh, video from YouTube. Um, now during the day, when I'm in the main room. I'll usually put on uh, one of these live cams from from uh, one of the small towns in Canada or 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 Wyoming or someplace like that where there's a you know, a street corner or you know, it's you know it's a it's holiday town or whatever. Uh, so I can actually feel like or pretend like I'm someplace else, uh, but someplace more you know at a resort or something. So I I can say that uh, for most of this last book. Uh, I, I think, uh, 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 what was the name of the town? There's, there's a, there's a, there's a town with a live cam in, uh, Le Leavenworth, Washington, I think, uh, was, uh, which has a lot of, uh, a lot of live cams, which is, uh, uh, I, which is a, uh, a, 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 on, on YouTube where, uh, you know, it's just people going about their business, uh, in a, in a big, uh, plaza. And then in the evenings when I am working in the office, uh, and, uh, what I'll do then is uh, on the TV in here, uh, there are YouTube channels, which are, um, uh, it's designed to help you sleep, okay. but it's, uh, it, it's a, it's, it's, it's like you're in the window of a spaceship. And so, uh, you know, you, you look up the window and the earth is rolling past and everything like that. Uh, and there's a, you know, there's artificial starship sound going on, yeah. uh, you know, just a low hum. And, you know, that's better than putting on a, a football game um, yeah. in terms of helping you concentrate. Yeah. Uh, in the mornings, actually, uh, like it's funny you say that on YouTube, I got a fireplace scene that I put on and it crackles yep. and makes a sound. And that's what I like to read to in the morning. It's yeah, it's, it's, it's like that. It's it's uh, it's uh, it's predictable. Nothing shows up as long as the ads don't appear. <laughs> so. <laughs> So are you one of the, like, tradition, do you have a notepad that you carry around with you when something sparks or you laptop? Uh, no, I, I have a lot, I have, I have a lot of, uh, you know, steno pads that are, or, 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 you know, that I, that I will scribble ideas on and things like that. And, uh, and then if some, if a book gets really complicated with a lot of different characters and where I've got a air traffic control where they're at, uh, like, you know, Strange New Worlds uh, is the story of basically four different personal quests that are intertwined uh, and how those got intertwined uh, following the different characters on this strange new world that's in the book. Um, that was a case where I mapped it out at the start. I said, okay, I have to get back to this character story this often. I have to get back to the main character story every other chapter. And here's how I'm going to handle this. And so so yeah, that is uh, that is uh, that is the case where, you know, the more complicated something gets, the more you need to have the, the notes in a spreadsheet or something like that. Is this the strange new worlds? Is this a new novel? Is this like your first novel in a while? Uh, uh, well, strange new worlds, uh, the high country is the first novel for uh, the strange new worlds TV series. It is not my first novel for Captain Pike and Spock. Uh, and number one, the characters in the streaming series, because I did a book uh, three years ago called The Enterprise War. And uh, it was a novel that tied into the Discovery TV show. But the point of the novel was to tell you where the Enterprise was during the Discovery show. So uh, it was its own story. It was off on its own. It's where the Enterprise was over the course of a full year of the TV series. Um, but what it functioned as is sort of, um, you know, I don't know if a prequel is the right word, but it is it is a, a proto uh, Strange New Worlds cast uh, okay. uh, you know, novel. And so I had already written that one. And that novel took place mostly in space uh, and had a lot of a lot of starship combat uh, and, and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Uh, and I decided that this book. You know the title, "Strange New Worlds." Um, 
I said, you know, I want to do a story where it's it's all on one planet, the whole thing. And uh, and so so there you have it. Uh, it's uh, it, it is. Yeah, the Enterprise is in the book. Okay. But, uh, you know, the the characters are stranded without access to their technology. So there is, again, sort of that Lost Tribe of the Sith vibe there. It's just I can't keep the characters on the planet for 5,000 years. That won't be allowed. Okay. Not too many spoilers here. It's not out yeah. yet, folks. So hold on, hold on. Well, that's kind of impressive that you said uh, a prequel because this you wrote basically the prequel to Star Wars Rebels as well. Yeah, and that, that came out a month before the TV show aired. So. Oh, man, <laughs> yeah. I bet you were kind of, there was a forward in there by Dave Filoni, hey? That's right. And, uh, you know, uh, Vanessa Marshall, uh, you know, and I, she's the voice of Hera. She did her reading for the book for Entertainment Weekly, and that's linked to on my farawaypress.com site. Uh, and she she spoke to me about how she used the book to kind of help find where Hera's head was and, and, uh, and everything. And uh, I'm like, you know, the fact that anybody thinks that we captured these characters' voices is spectacular because we didn't know what they were yet. <laughs> Yeah. So, so that that is the that is the uh, the, the executive producers advising us well. Okay, okay, and you, they'd heard them, and I had. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. So, has they have they reached out to you then for this new the show that's coming up with the uh, Strange New Worlds? Yeah. Uh, well, I what, with all these books, I work with uh, uh, all the streaming series books, which is. The two Discovery novels, uh, uh, which is Enterprise War and Die Standing, the Ro the Picard novel, which is Rogue Elements, okay. uh, and then the Strange New Worlds novel, all three of those, or all four of those books, I uh, I consulted with Kirsten Beyer, uh, who is, she was in the writer's room on Discovery. She is uh, one of the uh, creators of the Picard series, and she uh, is one of the executive producers and uh, script writers uh, for uh, Strange New Worlds. Uh, and so in these cases, uh, everything begins with me talking with her to find out where I can set a story, uh, mm -hmm. where we'll collide with something or won't collide with something, what might be an interesting kind of story to tell. Uh, and, um, you know, increasingly, you know, it, this is, uh, you know I, know, I know the high country was a case where I had the kind of story I wanted to do and it was totally, you know, that part was 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 uh, was mine to begin with, and then when I'm I'm working with her, it's figuring out okay, well, how can we narrow this down and make this fit, uh, and make this relevant to the the characters and the time frame and everything, uh, and so you know she she uh, you know did a, uh, you know a, a great service to the book there uh, by helping us to uh, you know sort of. Uh, zero in and focus uh, what we were doing so that it does really fit in with the, uh, the the TV show. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Is there, maybe this is a forbidden question, but is there one side that you like to write for more? Like, do you prefer to play around in the Star Wars? Oh, galaxy, it, oh well, or? no, it's, it's uh, whatever the franchise is, uh, you know, I don't, I, I try not to write for any franchises where I'm not a fan. Right. So, so there's that. And, and it's just a different feeling. It's a, you know, I, I would have had trouble doing a short story or a novella like the, like the ride for Star Trek, uh, uh, because it's got a much more comical star, star Warsy feel to it. Okay. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, I, I, I've joked that the rogue elements novel for, uh, for Star Trek is probably my Star Wars -iest Star Trek novel simply because it's, uh, you know, it's uh, it's got uh, a freighter captain and the adventures that he's going through in a realm where the Federation is not present, where Starfleet is not around. Uh, and, um, you know, so you can you can kind of have sort of the same feelings with things. But uh, but, you know, one of the things that you can do with Star Trek that you can't do with Star Wars is, um, you know, call back on uh, Earth history uh, and oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and refer to things. I mean. All of my books usually have um, you know, open with a quotation uh, from somebody who's a, a real life figure um, uh, at some point in history or the past. Uh, and sometimes there's multiple quotations because there's uh, multiple sections of the book. But, uh, you know, I could tell you that I'll tell you that Strange New Worlds opens with a quote from Daniel Boone. 
and that's a, that's all I'll say. That's cool. That's really cool. <laughs> well, it, you can't do that with a Star Wars novel. No, no, you can't. And the only reason I ask that is because yeah, I, I have some folks that listen to me that like Star Trek, and they ask me, "Oh, do you ever try?" And it's like I never got into Star Trek. I got nothing against it. Yeah. So I, I googled one day where to start, and it was like kind of blew no, my mind. No, there's a lot of places. Yeah. Uh, what I would say to folks, and I did a, I did a, uh, I did a, uh, a, a, a Twitter thread about this about a month ago, oh. uh, where I said. I, if you like Star Trek, here's my Star Wars novels that are for you. If you like Star Wars, here's my Star Trek novels that are for you. And it just depends on the story. Um, you know, if you like, you know, Han Solo, uh, 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 Chewie, uh, 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 Millennium Falcon uh, going around doing its thing, uh, you know, your book is Rogue Elements. Because uh, you don't have to know much at all about Star Trek other than here's a guy that got thrown out of Starfleet and he bought a ship. And, uh, you know, you're, you're there. I mean, that's all you need. Um, you know, if you're, if you're looking for, um, you know, something that is much more of a fleet action kind of thing, uh, where it's, it's a, uh, you know, a, 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 a ship in a strange, mysterious place that wanders into somebody else's war. Well, that's uh, the Enterprise War. Uh, the Enterprise uh, stumbles into somebody else's war and ends up being, uh, both the battleground and uh, and the prize for both sides uh, to go after. So um, you know, so I mean, if you're and if you're somebody who is a real um, you know uh, sort of a a naval uh, starship <laughs> naval wonk, somebody who really loves um, you know uh, you know starship designs and and uh, and and how combat works and fleet battles and everything, that's your book for that one. Um, you know, if you're, if you like, uh, you know, spy stories, um, you know, you're, you're probably gonna, you know, if the, the, the spy element to new dawn, um, uh, and of course you've got shows like Andor and everything else, uh, yeah. you know, that, that, uh, you know, that's, that's what die standing is. It's, it's the emperor, it's the, it's the evil emperor who has, has been kicked out of the mirror universe. Uh, it is her first mission for the spy agency uh in in uh, in the federation uh yeah. and it doesn't go well uh but but it's it, but the vibes are kind of similar so um and you know the uh the uh I, I would say that um if you liked lost tribe of the sith for reasons i've explained yeah it's very similar in the sense that it is the castaway kind of thing going on and the mystery is what is this world what is it about you know what uh, what are what are we permitted to do here? What are what is right to do here? Uh, as you saw in the Lost Tribe of the Sith, um, you know they didn't care what was right or moral or whatever. Right. But the Starfleet cast has the prime directive, and so they have to be cautious about what they do on this planet. So in a sense, this novel uh, could be said to be the flip side of uh, of Lost Tribe that's of the Sith. Cool. That's cool. That's really interesting. Yeah, because it's all I've always thought, you know, to me, Star Wars is more sci fi fantasy feel. It is correct. I mean, and, well, well, it's more it's more space opera is the term because uh, Star Wars, I can't do a story that hinges on uh, on science. I can't do something that hinges on, uh, well, this chemical property of this thing causes it to do that uh, or this or that or the other. Uh, yeah, you can't go too far into that. Whereas, uh, you know, Enterprise War has a extended bit uh, where, you know, we, we actually figure out, you know, if the Enterprise is, is, is downed on a planet, how do you get it up again? How do you get it aloft again? And, you ha and, we, had to, and we had to worry about, um, you know, physics. We had to worry about uh, also the imaginary physics of how the ship worked uh, and things like that. So, uh, you know, Star Trek just at its roots is a little bit harder science fiction. Um, yeah. whereas, um, you know, and, 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 and in strange new worlds, I actually have several advisors. There's a particle physicist who helped me with one part of the, uh, of the idea. I got a, a planetary scientist, uh, uh, who, who suggested some things. Uh, I also have an equestrian advisor, uh, you know, somebody who uh, works with horses and bloodstock, uh, to help me figure out another element of, of this book. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I, I even I even talked to a, a manager of a, a, a store that sold uh, bait and tackle 
So <laughs> because there was a there was a thing in the book, and I said, you know what, I need I need expert knowledge here. So that's awesome. Um, so yeah, and whereas in Star Wars, you you're a lot safer if you want to just make something up. Yeah, that I never would have thought that you went out and it, you know kind of asked people's advice on certain things you wanted to throw in the mix. You, you don't have to, but. I like it. I mean, when we no. when we did my uh, my prey trilogy for Star Trek, um, which uh, my prey trilogy is probably the equivalent for anybody who liked Knights of the Old Republic and the big, huge sprawling mystery because it's a big, huge sprawling mystery. Well, I had a lot of Klingons in it, and we had a lot of new Klingon words. So I went to a Klingon expert who not only helped us coin the correct words that we needed, but then he provided advice to the audiobook reader uh, Robert Petkoff. Oh. Uh, yeah. In, uh, in reading the Klingon for the audiobook. And Robert actually is the audiobook reader for Strange New Worlds, The High Country. And um, I did a um, I did a show on Wisconsin Public Radio, speaking of Wisconsin, uh, in December. Uh, if you go to WPR.org and just search my name, John Jackson Miller, uh, you'll find my episode of Route 51 that we did in December with uh, Robert Petkoff and also January Lavoie, who she not only read the die standing novel, but uh, she read the, uh, uh, the narrated uh, performed the book, but she also performed the two stories I did for, uh, for the, from a certain point of view in oh, star Wars. And so cool. that, that's a, that's a whole thing where we're talking about what's involved in doing the audiobooks. Yeah. You, you mentioned uh, Wisconsin radio. You've been doing that show for a while now. Yeah, I, I, I do it every years. year. Uh, the uh, the producer there, Rick Ryer, uh, it, you know, I, it, I actually had come in years ago for a uh, an audio bit that I was doing because I was on Marketplace, which was the uh, which was the uh, the, uh, the the financial show, uh, talking about the comics industry and my role with uh, and my role with another website I do called Comicron, uh, and uh, he found out what I did and uh, had me back in and. You know, it's uh, I don't know if it's an official thing or not. I wouldn't say that, but he's just tended to have me back every year right at Christmas. And so uh, so if you want to if you search my name, you're going to find about six episodes there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I came across that on social media. I'm not on Twitter. My kids just told me to get on Instagram. So I'm just learning I'm, all that yeah, stuff. I'm, you know, I'm, I, I posted, I think, my my second Instagram video two days ago. And with my rural Internet, it took it half an hour to post it. So, <laughs> hey, that's all right. Yep. I'm learning, too. So I'll have to link that in the description too, because that's a, I was catching up and them are really cool that you do that. And I had no idea about them. So oh, yeah, Facebook. No, that was a great episode. Yep. And in fact, they suggested at the end of that broadcast, that the maps that we have in the book, um, these will be made available uh, to the uh, buyers of the audiobook. Uh, yep. The maps will be because it'll, they, they're, they're able to do like a little special PDF um, cool. supplement. That's awesome for people. Is there anybody that you wished or that reached out to you to collaboration with? Has that ever? Uh, you know, uh, people have, uh, you know, occasionally asked, usually what they want to know is how I can get their story published. And of course I can't, um, you know, it's, I'm a freelancer. I'm on the outside. Uh, and, you know, the uh, people are always, uh, they say, I have an idea for a Star Wars story. Well, there's just nothing you can do at that point because these things are invitation only by the people who hold the licenses. And, you know, I think I told somebody the other day, you know, what happens is you write your own fiction or you write for somebody else and then you get approached to do these other things. You yeah. get the, the stamps on your passport. I got Star Wars because I had worked with Marvel. Uh, you know, I got to work with Marvel because I had edited a magazine in the comics industry for a decade at that point. Uh, and I knew people at that point and they kind of understood that I could, I could write and hit a deadline and manage a magazine. Um, and so, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where um, they're not legally allowed to even look at, um, you know, the outside material. I, I do occasionally, uh, you know, collaborate with somebody uh, frequently because of geography, it, it doesn't always work. Uh, my friend, James Mishler um, is uh, as a former uh, coworker, uh, and, but he's a game designer. And so uh, he and I uh, you know, collaborated on uh, the maps in this uh, because he knows a lot more about what should go onto a map than I do. Uh, and then uh, he and I also, uh, we actually did co-write uh, a comic series that is expected out sometime. Uh, there's, a, there's a comic book that we wrote with um, 
Dark Horse Comics, and it's already drawn, it's ready to go, uh, for a uh, video game called Skull and Bones. Uh, and it's a pirate video game from Ubisoft. And uh, the game has been delayed a few times, and uh, the comic has now been delayed along with the game. Yeah. Because there's no sense in putting it out before there's a game. Yeah, it seems like there's a lot of delays all over now lately. Yep. As of late, you know. Yep. Well, that's cool. I was going to ask you if is there anything that you got coming down the yeah, pipe? Yeah, that's that's uh, that's coming up, and uh, and and of course, as we've mentioned, the uh, the uh, you know the, yep. the, the, the night errant reprint, uh, Strange New Worlds. Get those pre-orders in. That's uh, the the twenty first of uh, of February, and I used to have a whole bunch of convention stops. Uh, you know, you know announced. Uh, I'm doing the, uh, the 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 launch of the novel uh, is at the West Town uh, Barnes and Noble in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, that is uh, February 21st at 7 p.m. Uh, that weekend, I am in Detroit at uh, Great Lakes Comic Con. The very next weekend, I'm at Emerald City Comic Con in Seattle, uh, and then two weeks after that, I believe I am in um, Richmond, Virginia, for. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, Galaxy Con Richmond, and there's more stuff to come that we haven't announced yet. And I just okay. hope my voice holds up. <laughs> yeah, you've been a bit like I mentioned earlier in the show, you've been a busy man. You're yep. out there. That's why, you know, and you just give off this. You just got a great presence to you, sir. You made me feel welcome. You know, I wasn't, you just, it's great talking with you. Well, I'm happy to be here. It is an honor to be able to talk about this stuff for, for a living. So, so yeah. yes, uh, yeah, thanks very much. And uh, I, 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 uh, people can find me uh, on the web. Uh, farawaypress.com is the, uh, the website where I've got behind the scenes notes on everything that I've done um, on Twitter and uh, also uh, post.news. I am JJM Faraway. That's J, John Jackson Baylor Faraway, JJM Faraway. Uh, and then, uh, then on Facebook and Instagram, I am, uh, just John Jackson Miller. Yeah. And I'll link all that in the description, but before you go, I just have a few fun questions that I ask everybody that okay. I have on. So, uh, in star Wars, yeah. what type of character you probably maybe even written yourself into star Wars and I would, I would do so if I was an author, but what type of character would you want to be a Jedi, a smuggler, <laughs> Sith, a bartender. I think I'd, I think I'd rather be Lando. <laughs> Lando. I, I'd rather I'd rather own the nice place and not have to make reservations. So that that would be your favorite character, you would say, would be. Lando. I, I I enjoy Lando. He's great. That's great. You know, there you're like the fourth person that I've talked to that Lando is their guy, and I got nothing against him because he's got a pretty good swagger, and he yeah. wears a cool cape. You there can't you beat that. What would your name be? <laughs> I, well, it, it probably wouldn't be John because I, I think it was, we already got a Luke. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, wow, I don't know. Uh, it's. Uh, I stump everybody with this one. Yeah, well, I was gonna say I could, I could take my middle name and uh, make it Jackson J A X X O N, but that's the rabbit. So <laughs> <laughs> I do that. Sure, I'll be Jackson. That's fine. Hey, there you go. What about what's your favorite lightsaber color? pretty simple one uh you know i we gave we gave zane a yellow lightsaber uh by mistake because the the uh the uh first action figure i got was uh luke skywalker with the yellow lightsaber so i wow. I, I just I, I i we just kept it and uh and you know they decided at some point that yellow lightsabers meant that he was a what they called a sentinel which meant that he was sort of a scout and that fit too yeah perfect Perfect. Well, Mr. Miller, it, you're, I'm just, I'm, an, I'm just blown away. You've done so much for us fans. I can't say thank you enough. Your work is incredible. And even on the, on the Star Trek side of things, oh, I'll sure. have to get on Twitter and look all that information up so I can start digging in. Okay. But uh, it's been a pleasure, sir. Thank you very much. Um, and that's it, folks. There you have it. New York Times bestselling author, John Jackson Miller. Get out there, meet him. And until next time. See you soon.